Peter. Hey, Pat. Um, How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. So uh, we've had some fun. Uh, we're um, it's the first time we've been able to get together in a long time. Yeah, it's been too long. Um, so uh, we have a variety of things we could discuss. Um, main too many. Thing, uh, main thing I think we'll start with is um, you've helped me tremendously. Uh, well, first off, why don't you um, why don't you just introduce yourself and give a general gist of um, like your your short introduction? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm John Eden. Um, I'm both a lawyer and a problem solver. Um, I've worked in a lot of big law firms, and I've also worked in a lot of technology companies. Um, I tend to think of uh, all sorts of uh, problems that one uh, encounters when building a company as being a function of, you know, it's maybe 20% technology not working and 80% people not working well together. So whenever you have those sorts of problems, you have to diagnose them really carefully at the beginning. And so, you know, if I were to boil down what I do into its simplest, yeah, simplest conception, I try to figure out what the problem is and define that really clearly. And sometimes that really takes more time than solving it. Cool. So one thing you've helped me tremendously with is this idea of first principles thinking. And um, could you just uh, describe first principles in kind of the most clear, concise way, like a, just a simple way people can understand first principles thinking? Yeah. So if you think about first principles from, you know, how everyone had parents mm -hmm. and everyone's parents had some rules that they gave them. And often when parents aren't that thoughtful, they just tell you that you have to follow these rules because they said so. Um, the first principle's mindset is that feeling you got as a kid when you just said, well, I need to know why. That's the core of first principles. It's curiosity and wanting to know why you should do or avoid doing something. So one way you have explained this to me in the past is like when you're young, um, the, the first thing you learn is very it's kind of that rule-based thinking. So like don't touch the stove because it's hot. Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of like – that type of thinking kind of keeps us safe, but if we're going to innovate, um, and then the example you gave me is um, Elon Musk has been very outspoken about first principles thinking, and the example he gives is uh, he, he thought up, when everybody told him you couldn't build an electric car, mm -hmm. he, he went and looked at the ingredients for a battery and like kind of priced the battery and mm -hmm. basically said, well, you're wrong. You're, you're saying you think that based on some other previous attempts. And so um, what you've explained to me in the past is it's, it's like don't use the past to dictate what you think the future is going to, but look for new facts and then base your decisioning on those facts. Correct. Uh, Elon did something similar when he decided to build SpaceX. Um, the idea there is very similar to Tesla. You look at all the components that go into a rocket and you figure out what the real price for those components should be. And then you also look at whether or not the materials used for core components should be swapped out for better materials or equivalent materials, which are just cheaper. It can be sourced differently. So you, when you think about that component, that chain of components, you just start from the beginning with no preconceptions about how you should do things. Right. So now that we've kind of defined first principles and uh, which, you know, to summarize is kind of an unlocking of what we think is possible or an unlocking of, of how we want to approach something, asking why, being curious. Right. How do you feel like first principles could be used by bu business leaders or product owners, CEOs to accelerate their business? Right. Right. So let's talk a little bit about acceleration first. So when you think about acceleration, what you're trying to do is decide what you really want to accomplish and then do those things in a shorter period of time in a more lean way. So you want to accomplish the same number of things in a shorter period of time. Also, if you can, with fewer resources, that will really make your um, it'll make your um, business healthier. It'll allow you to do more with fewer people and less resources. It will make you more investable by venture capitalists. So that's just a little bit of a detour on what it means to accelerate a business. Now, when, um, when folks have problems in running their businesses or in figuring out how to scale, 
it's really useful to figure out, well, at a, at a very first cut, is this a technology problem? Is this a people problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, you might have a really great uh, roadmap, a really great product roadmap. You have everything sort of mapped out, but you don't have the people to execute it, right? On the other hand, you might have really, really great people, but you haven't decided what you really want to build. In that second case where you have great people, but you don't know what you want to build, you're in a really tough spot because you might, let's say you have 50 employees, right? And you started out with an idea and it didn't really work out or it doesn't look like it's gonna work out. You've got great people, you've got 50 amazing people, but you don't have a clear product roadmap and you don't have product market fit. You don't even have the beginnings of it. You have a problem because um, the product vision you have should, at least on the hiring and scaling side, solve a lot of problems for you in the sense that it it points you in a certain direction. It doesn't answer all the questions for you. But, you know, if you're building rockets, <laughs> um, you know, you need some people who understand um, all of the principles of the practical applied principles of physics that go into building rockets. And if you don't have them, if you have 50 great people who are great at building social networking software, well, you've got the wrong team. Okay. So um, I think we want to back that into, uh, can, can you elaborate on a practical way? So it uh, sounds like you have in your mind some factors, right? So first principles um, in my estimation is to collect some data, but you also mentioned something uh, really important. Like, so figure out your KPIs, figure out what you're trying to accomplish. Right. Um, do an honest a gut check as if you're if you have the people who have previous experience. So we need people who've been there, done that around Sometimes. us. Yeah. Um to at least know what they've tried and, and what's worked and what's not. But then how do you a lot of times, you know, if you if people haven't been there, they might think of new new ways of approaching it. So yeah. how do you uh, here's maybe a good question. So you have expertise which is kind of like, I want people who've been there, done that. And then you have people who maybe haven't done it before, but, but will look at it differently. Mm -hmm. So which one is more likely to follow first principles? And is there like a balance? Because um, obviously we want, we want to accelerate. And first principles is kind of opening ourselves up to new opportunities or new options. Yeah. Uh, so, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. Well, so let me say that, let me say something really important before I really dive into what you asked. I think any rules of thumb here, anything I'm about to say, should not be treated as rules of thumb or axioms because this is all very dynamic. So, mm -hmm. take that, take everything I'm about to say with a grain of salt. If you're going to go into a new field or if you're going to disrupt an existing field, right? It's dangerous to privilege too much the expertise of people who've been involved in that field and who see the world in a static way. Sure. As a concrete example, um, think of Uber. Uber's a transportation business. It's also a logistics business, right? And so when, um, when Travis Kalanick went about raising money for Uber, a lot of investors didn't understand what he was about to do. They didn't use taxis. They didn't use that, those kinds of transportation services. And, and they didn't really see Travis as maybe the right guy because he hadn't been involved in the taxi, taxi industry. He hadn't been involved in transportation. He hadn't been involved in logistics. But he was proposing to build, you know, a kind of national brand. And I think that was a very bold idea. I think it was the right idea. You could see how it turned out. He was, to, in that world, an outsider. And I think the great lesson around Uber is that if you have somebody who believes that something can be done and then creates a good plan to start executing it, mm -hmm. that's really what you're looking for. And you know, you used Elon Musk's, uh, his company Tesla as an example earlier. You know, he had a very interesting, he wasn't part of the car manufacturing industry before Tesla. But what he said to himself is, if I build, um, if I build a luxury electric car, that will help prove the concept out I'll sell a certain number of them. It will never be profitable, but it will allow me to raise money to build a consumer-facing electric vehicle, which he mm -hmm. did. So he had that idea from the beginning. It was a great idea. A lot of people thought it would fail, but it actually prevailed. So I think, um, well, uh, so to bounce this back to you, um, it sounds like 
uh, there's this great notion of if you're trying to do something new, you don't necessarily have to listen to the past. So let me flip it a little bit. So I think we're saying first principles applies to these areas of innovation where we, um, we, we, we want to push the envelope forward. We have an idea. Right. Um, it's not in the market. We see it's clearly not in the market. And we, we want to have a different type of thought process to the people who say, no, that can't be done, or these will be the issues. Like a lot of entrepreneurs are really good, including myself. Like I'm really good at talking myself out of my own ideas mm -hmm. because of some of those, those factors that are like the opposite of first principles. Right. Right. So that's great. But then let's turn it on the other side because um, there are probably a lot of good lessons and methodologies and frameworks that like already exist, right? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. So in your um, experience, what are some really good uh, frameworks or things that you feel like have been tried and tested over time that an entrepreneur um, business leader should have in their like bag of tricks Yeah, that you're like... Oh no, that's not used in first principles. That's just like that's how it works, and you should you should be using those kinds of things. Like, you want to stand on the on the shoulders of the people who did it before. What's an example of that to you? Oh, lots of great examples. Um, What's your favorite one? <laughs> um, so let's start with the idea of um, of porting an existing product or service versus teaching someone how to do something entirely new. Okay. Right. So, uh, the mobile gaming world has a lot of these examples. So, um, prior to the smartphone, there was a game called Scrabble, right? And and people learned how to play it when they were little kids in the United States. Very popular game, very beloved game. And there was a studio out in Texas called New Toy that decided to shift that experience to these wonderful mobile devices, and that allow people to play. Uh, any of their friends, wherever those friends had to be happened to be located. So what you had there was a beloved product that people already knew how to use. So there's no friction in getting them to understand what the benefit of the product would be. They already understood the product. So all you had to do was shift it to this new platform. So the risk was all on the execution. So did you build the mobile app correctly? Is the back end well maintained by your engineers and so on and so forth? Yep. So if you take care of that, the probability you're going to have a great return, great revenues, great you know low ac customer acquisition costs, high retention, all those great metrics that people talk about. The probability all those things is going to go your way. It's very high. It's great. Um, on the other hand, if you build a product that people don't have any experience with in the real world. They don't have, there's nothing adjacent to that product that they've already used or seen. Then you are already at the jump, from the jump, you are facing an uphill battle because you're asking them to spend and invest their time in your product or service when they don't even have a clue what the benefit is. So they've got to expend some time learning how to use your product or service, but yet they have no idea what the what the benefit's going to be. Sure. So. When entrepreneurs come through and they have ideas, I, one filter I put them through is this, you know, is it, a, is it a reintroduction of a prior product or service experience? Or is it genuinely something new that's in either, you know, it's either doesn't have a category um, or it has a category, but people have never seen this particular thing before and there's nothing, there's no close analogies to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I think... Um B2B SaaS folks figure this out too because how so? Um, like, uh, well, when you're so say you're used to doing something very manually, you know, um, you're used to kind of pushing papers, making phone calls, answering emails, mm -hmm. and that's how you provide your service, right? And then, um, B2B SaaS comes in and says, by using our platform, you can now manage this work digitally. And instead of, uh, you know, instead of using it, uh, you know, doing it through emails, we need you to come enter a bunch of data mm -hmm. and then let the software kind of do the work for you. And there is an education process in there. Um, so much in the same way, somebody may have to take the, the, we're really talking about the adoption curve or that learning curve. And, um, and, and that's going to be, be there when you're kind of, paving a new path or helping people do something differently than they used to do it. Right. 
Like psychologists have a, have a label for this. They call this cognitive load. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, sometimes there has to be a learning curve. And some great products have a steep learning curve. Salesforce has a significant le- learning curve, but the benefits are profound, right? Yeah, I kind of think about the early iPhone keyboard and it compared to the BlackBerry. Like everybody, there's, there's these kind of half steps I think we see mm-hmm. that, um, that are successful for a while. Right, um, where they they're they're closer to what people were doing before, like the quirky keyboard was closer to what people were doing before sending messages, you know, AOL messages with their computers. Right, um, and then I remember resisting the early the earliest versions of the iPhone because I I I had my CrackBerry. I really liked my my CrackBerry's keyboard. Um, and a little bit of iteration went on, and mm-hmm. then I realized, wow, I can type just as fast. Uh, and then you add a little autocomplete, and the product gets better. So iPhone taking that kind of extra leap uh, is a good... A good. But um, back to that question, just are there any other frameworks or mental models that you've seen benefit folks um, helping them accelerate? Are there any other mental models that, that you... You you just think people should dig more into so first principles for innovation and trying new things, um, but any others for just you know conducting business efficiently and and then moving faster. Well, I mean, um, one of the frameworks. So if we shift from developing products and services over to like building a healthy corporate culture, right? If we just shift topics a little bit, um, I think it's really important to. Um, There's two kind of general principles that, I mean, they apply differently depending on the organization and they need to be fine-tuned. But there are two principles when you're trying to create a good culture that I think really, really apply. So one is to make sure that um, what people are actually able to do and what people are incentivized to do in your organization reflects your values. So don't have a set of values on, you know, on the website or up in the offices of your swanky startup location if what people are actually incentivized to do is very different. You know, there's this old idea, which I think is a really good one. Um, you know, your culture is what people are allowed to get away with. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, I really like that. So being values-based organization, really making sure that reality reflects what you've said on your mission, vision, and values, and there's uh, that uh, values alignment. Yeah. Totally agree. Um, we've done a lot of consulting with folks about that, and then making sure their tech roadmap also ties into the uh, mission, vision, and values. Um, yeah. That's really cool. Uh, another thing you and I uh, talk about um, – I understand one of the things that you do in your practice is you help um, engineers, you know, people with special knowledge, negotiate their comp. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I've done that in the past. Yeah, yeah, cool. And um, this this is really interesting to me. You you've also mentioned that one of the kind of key key questions you do a lot of great things. Um, uh, First, why don't I say it as a question? Um, how kind of how do you approach that? Um, what are you trying to help people do? Kind of describe the service because it's it's super valuable, and I just I want to let you kind of explain what you do for folks. Yeah, so um, you know, a lot of people the minute they think about negotiating a uh, you know uh, an employment package, they 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 think right about they think they go directly to oh my gosh, am I going to lose an opportunity if I advocate for myself? And I think this is really the wrong mindset. I think um, finding the right role, especially if you're more than five or six years out of school, um, is really in a conversation, an extended conversation with uh, a potential employer. You might even think of them as a partner because in order for you to take a role and advance in your career, in addition to the cash compensation and any equity you might get, the employer also has to be able to offer you a great place for you to expand your skill set and to spread your wings. And so you have to ask yourself when you're talking to a potential employer whether or not those 
tangible and intangible things that you want are there. So I capture all this with a concept of alignment. You know, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, based on this spec for a role, is the employer really aligned with what, who I am, what I want to do, and how I want to grow? So I, there's a huge percentage of cases where if, if somebody, whether it's a business development professional or an engineer or a lawyer or a, a management consultant, if they really do that analysis, they're not going to take the offer <laughs> because there are going to be some key elements that are missing. And I, you know, I think it's really important for people to slow down and really um, ask those questions because you, every year of your life, you know, you can, they, there's this whole, another adage, which is great. You can always make more money, but you can never make more time. And I think that's really true. And I think if you just keep that in mind, when you're thinking about moving from job A to job B, when you're thinking about the discomfort of negotiating a job uh, offer, you have to keep all these things in mind. You know, every day is unique and you'll never get it back. Yeah, no, that's totally, um, totally right. I think, um, uh, you're speaking into one, the grass is greener is kind of a psychological thing. We saw that a lot post COVID, like people kind of in the drudgery of working from home, which was new for some folks. And then kind of coming out and just, I just need to do something different. It must be better somewhere else. And, and, um, and so we had kind of a great resignation, which I, one explanation potentially is, is just kind of that grass is greener mentality. Um, and so consider that the other, I think you're saying is don't be overly opportunistic. Um, but think about fit, like they really think about the fit for yourself. Um, one absolutely. Of, one of the things that you've also mentioned is really figuring out. And I, I think this is super valuable, uh, especially for like younger folks is connect your, uh, you often say like, what are the KPIs involved in your role? Or what are the outcomes involved in your role, mm -hmm. and then what's the value of those outcomes to the, you know, to the business, and kind of understanding your fit within the business model. Oh yeah, and this can be really, like, really powerful. I mean, if you're inventing um, something like truly new for this company in the space, you you want to kind of account for that because mm -hmm. uh, that could be hugely valuable, and if you don't recognize it, then um, the business may not tell you. Right. Um, and you might have been somewhere else before with a certain level of like um, comp. And then in this new business, you're you're just in a more innovative spot. You're just, yeah. your position or role. So um, that can be a new calculus or a new calculation for value that didn't exist before. So really thinking of it from a business can help you either understand why you're needing to be paid what you're currently being paid or help you advocate because right. if you're going and advocating for the business like look i just want to make you guys really like you're going to the business owners and saying i really just want to make you guys rich and so and i'm going to do that i have confidence in my abilities because of the innovation you've asked me to do or right. or the role you've asked me to play and so i'm just i'm just saying hey let me share in some of that success yeah yeah, I mean, you know, I said a few minutes ago that it's really important for a candidate to slow down and think about whether or not a role um, offers all of the, uh, has all the elements that they really need to grow. So that's all about the candidate saying, uh, being clear about who they are and what they want. But the uh, you've just hit on the other side of that coin, which is that you, as a candidate, you have to think, or as an employee, right? If you're already inside an organization, this is still important to stop and think about. Who are you to the organization? If, depending upon where that organization is in its life cycle, you may be either really, really valuable or you may be more of a commodity. We're at the All In uh, Summit right now, and Chamath Palihapitiya is a great example of someone who worked at Facebook in a growth capacity at a time when you know, getting to a billion users was really important for Facebook's long-term strategy. So to the extent that he could deliver that, and he did, he was going to be incredibly well com uh, compensated. At that particular time, that skill set that he had would just fit like a, like a key beautifully into a lock. 
And that's the best position to be in if you're extremely ambitious, right? And so you have to slow down and ask yourself also, what stage uh, in the company's life cycle am I at now? And how do they view me relative to, you know, where's the heart of the business? It, you know, to use the Chamath example, the heart of the business when he was there was growth, right? It wasn't, and it was user growth. It wasn't even making sure that all of their ad tech was up working smoothly and generating, you know, tons of revenue and, you know, growing in terms of um, uh, advertiser base, you know, quarter on quarter. That's not what the key metric was at the time. So understanding how you can help the company grow at a particular point in its life cycle is just critical because you might not be at the heart of the business. But, and if you understand that, you can kind of understand maybe why you're compensated a little differently. So there's a there's two sides of it. I mean, you can, in one circumstance where you're at the heart of the business, you can push, you can advocate for yourself, right? And you should. On the other hand, if you're if you're a couple of layers out from the center of the heart of the business, then you know, you just you can rationally understand how they're going to compensate you a little bit differently. Right. And I think that is a good segue to now talk about kind of as we look forward, um, your job, like the job in engineering, um, any STEM field, um, even uh, at the at the All In Summit today, what we, one thing we even saw was a completely AI produced um, video, mm -hmm. like, like little short film. Yeah. And um, the, so what the gentleman explained was that the script, the audio, Mm -hmm. The video all um, done. So there were people who kind of put the pieces together and, and played kind of a overseer or producer. But a lot of the heavy lifting was done through these AI tools. So now as we're looking at um, STEM field, like a layer of abstraction that's now looking at for anything repetitive. Mm -hmm. So anything that people are doing in kind of repetition, I think in engineering, mm -hmm. we're looking at like how many REST APIs have we built, like yeah. a bunch of backends for, for things. And even though that has been getting simpler and simpler, it's ripe for an AI abstraction. Right. And I mean, we're even working on things like that. Um, and, um, and so now you look at, okay, is what I'm doing um, somewhat replaceable and should I go figure out those more automated or abstracted ways of doing it? Should I should I basically focus on um, being a teacher of the AI and a supporter of that uh, or am I going to get displaced? What are your thoughts on that and um, how can people start to prepare in, in your in your yeah. guess? I think we're all kind of trying to figure that out. Yeah, I agree. So the first thing I would encourage people to take a deep breath and, and relax a little bit because automation of the type that we're going to see with AI in bike in, in terms of, you know, what it fundamentally is, is not new. I mean, AI is going to more rapidly affect a, a lot of jobs, a lot of creative jobs, a lot of engineering jobs and so on and so forth. But I think we've seen automation before, um, in the industrial sector in the sixties and seventies when, you know, when it was possible to start measuring people's performance, people were aggressively, their performance was ag aggressively calibrated. And what that did was folks who were not willing to adapt their behavior to the new world got, you know, they got pushed out or they got, or their comp got affected. And so, you know, this is not, you know, on a category basis new. I mean, we've kind of seen this before. Sure. And I think people who are in highly commodified fields, even services fields, they feel this in the way that they're measured at work, and they they they're you know from their point of view they might feel a little dehumanized, right? They might feel like their contribution is more than just you know the hours that they put into the job. Um, but I think the way to the way to think about this is to map what's going to be available in the job market to what you are really good at and what you're really passionate about. Um, because if you don't really enjoy something, you're never going to become truly great at it. And so, you know, Jim Carrey has this funny uh, little story he tells about his dad. He says, my dad died killing himself trying to su succeed in a career that he didn't care about. <laughs> He's like, don't do that, you know. Find something that you're actually good at 
and that you connect with and then you know put the pedal to the metal with respect to that career and i think what ai the positive pressure that ai can put on every single person whether you're just starting college or whether you just graduated or whether you just got out of grad school wherever you are in your career think of it as that really positive it's a it's a harsh pressure but i think you should think of it in a positive way because it's going to force you really as quickly as you can to um to basically fill in the variables to that equation. Mm -hmm. That kind of, you know, the industrial psychologists call this match quality. What is the quality between, what is the match between the, um, the skills and capacities you have on the one hand and what the job really rewards and requires on the other hand? Right. That's right. match quality. I think another really positive thing is, uh, and, and I talked to a lot of CEOs about how much time they're working on the business versus in the business. Okay. Um, so a lot of times you're, maybe you're a founder who's doing a lot of the sales, you're kind of a sell founder, or you're doing a lot of the um, product ownership, or you're, you're, working, you're working on the business. You haven't quite got to a place where you're, um, you, you know, maybe, maybe you're still kind of getting started, so you, you haven't built up the, the team to really help you level up. Right. And um, I think what this does, the AI will do, is it will get everybody in the organization to think about on versus in. Because if you think about truly like high value in sort of roles where I'm doing the task, mm -hmm. um, that's dangerous to only do that. So we really talk about even, even for like your – uh, senior folks, e even maybe your like lead engineers, they should be thinking about on versus in at right. at least an eighty twenty. Right. right. Think about the way you're doing your work. So if you're um, the way you're doing the work, the principles and methodologies in the marketplace for doing that particular role. Right. Um, and take some time to kind of at, think about what you're doing, the profession you're trying to achieve. In an abstract way, that's the on, you right? Know? And then, and then, of course, you got to do your work and and do the in stuff. But um, I think AI starts to um, amplify folks that are willing to think about their like think about the abstraction, the best way their job is done, and um, and look for efficiency gains and things that automation can help them, you know, do better. Uh, we do a lot of RPA, like robotic robotic process automation, mm -hmm. which is essentially using a, a digital workforce. We mm -hmm. create bots, and then those bots displace labor. And a lot of times in the adoption curve of the rollout of the RPA, we see tremendous fear, not tremendous, we see fear from the folks whose job used to be in the action of data entry. Right. And then some folks kind of click like, oh, wait, you still need me to be the surveyor of quality around what the digital workforce is doing. Right. And so I need to be the surveyor of quality. I need to really care about that. Uh -huh. But then when they're, um, uh, you know, maybe a bonus or, or something gets tied to, still tied to the production. Mm -hmm. So essentially, like, we'll still incentivize you for the amount of stuff that goes through the process, this is a sexful, successful fulfillment of the, the data entry flow. We want you to be also responsible for quality. Yeah. Something clicks and they're like, oh, you mean this is helping me do my job? Yeah. It's not actually, it's not going to like replace me, but it's now an extension of, um, you know, in law enforcement, they talk about the, the sidearm being an extension of your body. Yeah. Um, in martial arts, they talk about it if, if you're starting to use some kind of um, self-defense weapon or whatever. So um, if, if these automations are an extension of the creativity or the output that we want to do, and we realize that we can um, be kind of part of that success, then I think great things can happen. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go nerdy for a bit. Oh, please. We so, because you just triggered a great thought, which is all around how humans change their environment to make it 
easier for the next generation of humans to do even greater things. So there's a, uh, an evolutionary biologist in Australia named Kim Sterelny, and he's famous for this idea of co-adaptation. And co-adaptation is just like the academic name for what humans do when they manipulate the environment so that the next generation of humans that come in find that environment easier to use. So they're actually pushing down all the rote work um, to a lower level. So, it's, so what they're focusing on is the more interesting creative choices. And um, what, everything you just said reminded me of that concept of co-adaptation because with respect to AI, maybe that's the right way to think about it. AI is a massive leap forward with respect to our ability to use the technical environment to accomplish things that we really care about. So there's a shift, and to your point, there's a shift in what you focus on. You're focusing on these higher order tasks, right? And you're letting all of the rote, repetitive stuff get pushed down in, into, the, into the LLMs or whatever other AI model we're working with, whatever, whatever other model's been trained. The sure. LLMs are not the end of AI. <laughs> right, right. Right, they're just our, our best. Really, our, whatever automation it is, the AI correct. is just going to facilitate some sort of decision-making uh, complex decision making automation, um, but yeah, there'll be automation that will. The environment's truly new, right? And we mm -hmm. saw that today at the All In Summit. There are all of these videos out on YouTube, and we encourage our our listeners to go like check them out. It's like Harry Potter, but in Italy, and it it's just hilarious, yeah, yeah. you know, or you know Star Wars, but in Russia. <laughs> And all, or you know, um, the Ma the Matrix, a la Bal Balenciaga, all this <laughs> yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's really it's so fun. Cool. Someone just wants to put together something creative, and instead of getting, you know, twenty people together to work on it for six months, you basically do it in a couple of days. Yeah, and for something of that level of value, like a a, a concept that just needed to kind of be a viral thing, um, how interesting is that, right? That we yeah. can now, oh, this is an idea. We can try out a lot more ideas, see how um, the population feels about them, and then decide if we want to invest in them more. Um, so, so in a way, this kind of like modeling of, um, and you know, we talk a lot about that. You know, what I find between a, a founder who's successful and a founder who's uh, take, is taking a lot of risk is how quickly can you get some idea, um, you know we've just kind of seen like a, a degrade in the amount of venture capital that's available for a startup. Oh yeah. And, um, you and I remember kind of the, pr before this, uh, kind of uptick in VC where, where money, you know, I, I call it like the SAS craze, you know, you had a thousand users, they weren't even paying for anything. <laughs> you could get money, you know, and <laughs> that ZERP environment. Yes. And they were yeah. even like, you know, I'd like to raise 2 million. Here's three, you yeah. know, there, we, we came, we've kind of come out of this cycle where it just seemed like the, the money was growing on trees. If you had, um, any level of execution going on, um, or if you dropped out of Stanford <laughs> or if you dropped out of Stanford. Uh, so now it's a little more difficult. Like most of the VCs, uh, our clients are talking to are saying, get to a million in ARR, then we'll talk. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be this lower level of support for those early stage pre-product, pre-revenue ideas. Right. Um, so one of the things we've been talking a lot about is going back to the bootstrapping era, back to the bootstrapping tools. And the recent successes that I've seen are really good at, at not even an MVP yet, but materials that allow them to prove uh, uh, their concept. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a high value content offer like an HVCO or something to just say, is there interest? Right. And, and you just kind of triggered that for me because you're talking about these uh, these funny concepts that were able to be low, low, lower produced, but we could see if they were a good idea, see how they would resonate. Um, and, and so um, to form that as a question, how do you see the startups kind of needing to change? Like what do we do with startup culture now that we don't have the money everywhere? And then have you seen any, or does that strike anything with you about m more like a bootstrapping uh, startup style rather than the you know big seed rounds or safe rounds like we have seen in the past. It doesn't seem like it will continue. 
It's a great question. So number one, it's not just that um, it's not just that people aren't writing checks um, that readily right now. It's the people you know. A lot of VCs are putting their portfolios up for sale. <laughs> there's mm-hmm. a there's a good story in the information about this just the other day. Um, I would say you know I've been involved with a couple of startups where that were immensely successful, including New Toy, and and those founders they bootstrapped at the beginning. They had a little bit of private money, but it wasn't like traditional venture capital. I mean, their cap table was very simple when they got acquired. So there's value in being scrappy no matter what era you're in. Um, I think that, you know, the first thing to- Let me interrupt you because I I don't know if people will understand. So you were involved with New Toy that built Words With Friends. Yep. And then Words With Friends, New Toy, sold to Zanga. That's right. um, uh, For an undisclosed sum. Uh, But it was- it was it was a great kind of success story for this little uh, boutique um, game studio that was in my hometown, McKinney, Texas, yep. where where I was living at the time. Um, shout out to our buddy Jeff Dagley, who was also there, yep. uh, who we both know. Dave and Paul Bettner, Marshall Young, a bunch of other people. Yeah, there a, a good Grant, collection. Grant of, Yank, yeah, yeah, a, a bunch of really cool people um, that kind of got to to journey through that in a you know, kind of like in my neighborhood. Um, so that was really cool success story, but I just wanted to fill in everybody in on that because, you know, you learned a lot through that experience and yeah. it was a huge success story that you experienced. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if this is, I don't want, you know, this may frustrate some of our listeners because they're, they're looking for, uh, you know, some easily actionable um, recommendations. But one of the things that that studio had going for it is that uh, Paul and David Bettner had collected the best game designers in the entire state and put them all under one roof and gave them the freedom to build great games. And that was something which I think of that as a first principles choice. Um, if you want to build a great gaming company that builds evergreen games, will you put the power and influence in the hands of people that actually build the games? And it seems so simple. But it's not simple to a lot of gaming companies. A lot of gaming companies get started by people who have, a, they're they're deeply impressive in certain ways. Like they've gotten MBAs, world's best universities, or they've had accomplishments in other business areas. But they're not game designers. They don't love games. They haven't been playing games since they were three and a half. So the first thing to think about in this new environment of scarce capital is to be sure that you have an idea of who needs to be on the team and why. What is it about the things that you want to build that makes the particular people you want to have involved so critical? That's the first thing. And if you can get the people there, then maybe you can, um, if you really need to raise some money, maybe you can raise it from non-traditional sources. I mean, to take Texas as an example, a lot of the people who actively invest in startups are not traditional venture investors. They're, they might they might have a family office or not. They just might have made some money earlier in their career, and they they happen to really like your grit and your and and what and what your vision is, and so they decide to give you some money. That can be enough in some of these cases. And I don't I don't mean to. I don't mean to oversimplify because some 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 startups need more capital than you can get from a friends and family round. So I don't want to I don't want to no, reduce yeah, the complexity think, of the problem. No, you're totally right. So when we raised for Legal Inc., we indexed heavily. Um, the first thing we did is we went and talked to all the angels that would sit us, um, that would that would that would pitch. Right. And this was great because um, we weren't especially good at pitching at the time, and so to go. Talk to all the angels was a, a great, you know, trial run. I think in our first angel presentation, um, somebody said like, "What's your burn rate?" And we were like, we answered with like <laughs> how much money we spent every month, just our outflow number, yeah. uh, instead of like, no, we were we were zero. We were we were basically reinvesting what we were making, but we weren't losing any money, mm-hmm. which was kind of rare for a startup trying to get angel money. So. If we'd answer that problem correctly, so we come out of there, we're doing Google searches and like, oh, dang, you know, we got to yeah. get this vocabulary down. Yeah. So going around with the angels can help you kind of get that. If, if you really, I mean, shoot, if you could teach yourself the vocabulary before you go kind of burn some intros, fine. But it's a, it's a somewhat safe place to learn. Um, and most of them are very helpful. Um, 
and and then kind of like build a funnel of the investors mm-hmm. and maybe even start locally. I mean, mm-hmm. there's there's tons of folks that would like to um, be in that community and help that community grow. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think this idea of like jumping to the institutionals um, is probably not going to be fruitful for a while. Kind of like working your way, taking the time and doing the uh, being diligent and disciplined to kind of start with the the local angels and kind of work your way up. Um, I think that's a great idea. In fact, uh, what but, what when you so when you were pitching Legal Inc, what were some of the tactics that were successful with those smaller angels? Um, just I think for me it was going through the process. And um, let me also say that most angels are kind of looking for uh, like the next Facebook or something. They're kind of looking for something really innovative. Yeah. Um, and, and they probably don't have a, a bunch of money to like their investable assets is going to be lower. And so they are going to be really selective. Mm-hmm. And so um, that makes a lot of folks feel like uh, they're wasting time. Okay. So it is a frequency play. So you're you're pitching a bunch of angels, but each one that you talk to may give you something new. Mm. Um, I remember that there was this this guy that had basically been a pioneer. I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, um, but he was a he was an older gentleman. Unforgivable. Yeah, <laughs> he was an older gentleman, uh, uh, you know, very, very senior in years. He must have been in his 80s, late 80s, almost 90s. Um, and he came and spent like two, three hours with us in our office. He came to see us after we pitched him. Okay. And some of the things he said, he was a pioneer in aluminum studs. Mm-hmm. And so you'd look at the, like the growth in the Dallas area and he probably sold most of the aluminum studs that were in this area. And just hearing his story of how he bought like a, a, a really small aluminum stud manufacturing plant that was uh, late or that was kind of dying yeah. from mismanagement and, um, and he, he bought it. And he explained that back in the day, the way he found about the company was through a magazine ad. Uh Um, And he he took the company over. And then, you know, if you think about the number of aluminum studs that were uh, in the, you know, in the market or steel studs, you know, metal, um, you know, metal studs for offices rather than wood. And uh, just, you know, to hear some of his stories and some of his thoughts um, was extremely, extremely cool. And he gave us a couple of nuggets uh, that were just really helpful. And, um, and I would say that too, you know, just each, each angel gave us something. Even if it was, I'm bo- really bored with your guys' pitch or I totally don't understand or this isn't sexy enough for me. Yeah. Um, but then we m- met a few guys that were just – this is interesting. We, we see your numbers. We see how you're acquiring customers. We, um, we see that your tech team, your tech team is like well accelerated and well run. There were just a lot of things that, you know, you'll, you'll get some that'll give you that enough attention and then they'll make, start making some introductions and Uh you put your round together. And it, it's, it, it's a great process, but you, you, you do have to play a little more of a, a numbers game and, um, uh, we also so we just built out a really big list and then just crushed the list and then we even had a lead investor like back out on us at the last minute and so we had to rerun the list, mm-hmm. drop our evaluation slightly, yeah. and um, and you know get get the next best offer on the quick. Yeah. Um, I'm glad I'm glad I asked this question because the way I see everything you just said is that you. You know, you guys uh, gave yourself a PhD in sales. You're, in some sense, I mean, it may not seem this way, but in some sense, your investor is like a customer. You're understanding what the customer wants or needs. Yeah, and because you're, you're selling time. your equity, really. You're, sell, <laughs> you're selling equity to them. That's right. So they're your customer, and you have to understand what the customer expects in exchange for the equity. You know, I remember back in 2012, um, we were can't, we were uh, trying to raise money for a company called Mito Play. I was going to join and be the chief product officer. It was in the lottery space we wanted to bring 
uh, the lottery to mobile. Mm-hmm. It's a great idea. It's a seventy at the time it was a seventy five billion dollar um, market, a huge market, huge opportunity. But all the state lottery commissioners weren't interested in developing their own mobile apps. And they generally, they were, it's not like they were asking entrepreneurs to come build these platforms so that they could, uh, you know, have some innovative games that were based on lottery products. They didn't, they weren't asking for it, but we thought, you know, this is something that has to be built. And once they, once the state lottery commissioners understand the compelling nature of this gaming ecosystem, boom, it's just going to be so easy. Well, when we were looking to raise money, uh, we talked to Excel and the partner there said to me something I'll never forget. He said, I really don't know how I can justify dump putting money into this company. It's a, the market is massive. The opportunity is clear. And you know, you've got some great plans on what the products you want to build. There's so much this de-risk. But what's not de-risk for me as a venture capitalist is business development. I have no idea when a state lottery commissioner is going to sign a deal with you. And neither do you. Mm-hmm. you know? And that was a great conversation because this particular uh, VC was incredibly honest. I learned so much about the pressure that that person was under. A business development risk of that type is something that doesn't make sense to their model. So unless you can de-risk it, they can't invest in you. And by the way, I think the, 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 the other thing I would encourage people to think about is that VCs are not gods. They're not demigods. You shouldn't think of them that way. You should think of them as people who have their investors and they answer to their LPs. And so you should be mindful that they're under pressure too. I think sometimes when people approach angels or VCs, there's some they're 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 out there. They're like you know in the clouds yeah. like God. Yeah, Don't you have f- to be super careful of that because it's the guy that gave you twenty five grand that can be the most annoying. Right, um, right. They're not gods, but you have to understand the commercial pressures they're under, and you have to understand their business model. And if you do that, those conversations can be a lot more productive. And you don't have to walk out of the. If someone says no, you can walk out feeling fine because you know exactly why they. Say yeah, that. I, I, I think um, a lot of times too, in our in our early career, we're comfortable having a boss, right? Mm-hmm. And so. Um, one of the things that I encourage my team to think about is, um, is, is, a, is a certain type of um, objectivity. Like sometimes we just have a, like a kind of a crusty attitude or um, because of the way we're, we were raised, maybe we have like an authority thing. And so um, we can have this kind of thought process of like, oh man, you know, they're doing this wrong or that wrong or, or whatever. And I found it really healthy just to step away and say, hmm, if, if, if I were my boss, what would I ask, what would I want to do? And it's because if I can think of what it is that they should change or do different, then now I have a responsibility to ask them, hey, this is what I need to be successful. Could you do this differently? Mm-hmm. And um, come to find out, most of them would probably do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you needed to figure out a different way to run your budget or you needed to, you know, but you kind of have to step in their shoes and think, what could you do? And th- this, um, to go back to the VC question, this is kind of um, the way to leverage VCs is say, this is what I need. These are the challenges I'm having. Can you help me? Because mm-hmm. it's your investment I'm trying to do. And not necessarily overexpose weakness or be... Um, uh, emotional, but you know, if you're finding it difficult to find, you know, that specialist yeah. engineer, or you need a really good, um, uh, you know, financial planning or bookkeeper or whatever, how, how you know, they they will always have really good recommendations and really good associations um, to help you, and so thinking of like leveraging them in that way, but also. Um, not taking your background where you've always had a boss and there's some comfort in that. Just do me, do tell me what I need to do and I will go do it. Even if it's a really challenging thing, uh, some uh, entrepreneurs got comfortable to that. So then they go through this really uncomfortable time where they are the boss. There is nobody above them. They're kind of not accountable to. And um, what I see sometimes is then they raise money and then they're like, okay, VC, just tell me what I'm supposed to do next and I'll go do that. It There's something in our, 
just in our makeup yeah. where it's comforting to have authority sometimes yeah. because then when it's not quite going right, then we're like, well, but that's what you told me to do. And so we want to sort of, um, I think it's a human thing to almost want like a plausible deniability. And what VCs really want is you to own it. So you're, the, the reason why they're investing in 100%. you is because you're going to own it. You don't just say, well, I did what you told me to do and it 100%. didn't work out. 100%. So let me riff right off that. So uh, there's a guy called David Hornick, very successful venture capitalist, he used to run. Uh, he was one of the main GPs over at um, uh, August Capital. Now he runs a firm called Lobby Capital with a guy called Buddy Arnheim. He used to be a, a ECBC partner at Perkins Coie. And wonderful guys, wonderful team. And, you know, I was having breakfast with David one time, and we were talking about this new VC model that a lot of firms are chasing, wherein the firm provides a lot of ancillary support. So in addition to giving capital to their portfolio companies, they provide recruiting support and marketing support and branding support and this grab bag of stuff. And I'm not going to name any names because it's not a good idea. Yeah. But, you know, what David said was, if I don't believe that an entrepreneur either already has these skills or can quickly learn the ones that they need to scale up, then I'm not going to invest because I need to be able to put my head on the pillow and go to sleep knowing that there's a good chance that this could work out. Not that as a statistical matter, every one of my portfolio companies is going to have an exit, but just that it's possible with the skill set that this team has for them to pull it off. I don't want to go in there and invest in somebody unless I believe that they're going to do what they need to do. I'm not an expert in XYZ. And, and so the point you're making really reflect my, my, what my contribution to this is, or this, this part of the conversation is just that really uh, thoughtful VCs, they feel really strongly about what you said, but from their point of view, because they, you know, if they're honest with themselves, there's a lot of things that they're not experts in. And so if they try and give you, if they, you know, if they're sitting in the cheap seats and they're trying to tell you what to do, even these thoughtful VCs know that that's a disaster too. You've got to figure it out if you're the entrepreneur. You've got to own it. Well, I've also seen, I, what, I, one thing I've witnessed is this sort of um, calculation, and I don't know if it's subliminal or not, but it's kind of a calculation around... Um, it's a calculation around like if I if I'm complete if I follow the recommendations that the the VC is more likely to give me another round or participate in the next round. And what I don't think folks realize is when that decision point of the B round or or the or the A round extension or mm. whatever that is, right? The the more money uh, discussion that new calculus enters that VC's mind. Okay, how's the business doing? It's almost like they they will and should look at the business all over again and see if it's worth the additional shares. Right. I don't think that their calculus will be, well, did they follow all the recommendations that I gave them? Because they've probably forgotten about most of those recommendations anyways. Well, I mean, the, the first principles way to think about this is that if they're, if they're gonna, if they're gonna get their, if they're gonna activate their pro rata rights and do that follow on investment because you followed the leader, you played, you're the little duck following around the mother duck. I mean, that's not a great VC. <laughs> that's Correct. not the basis on which they're gonna decide. Correct. To and I'm just saying, like, it's yeah. like a subliminal, maybe mental mistake that, like, well, if I, you know, do the recommendations of of the the VC, then, uh, you know, then I'm I kind of ensuring. Through almost like this this mom guilt kind of thread. like they'll they'll raise the next they'll they'll put in on the next round was, and I, I would just say that it's going to be a completely objective calculated decision whether they do or not it's not going to have much to do with all of those kind of points in time so you know if you um, you know if you decided to continue to do offshore and the investor said i like yeah. onshore better or you know like these these are your choices that you need to own let me let me put together a frame that captures what you just said so this is just me giving our listeners a frame so advocacy right versus um, hypothesis testing so if you're an entrepreneur and you think that your job with respect to your investor is to advocate for something you've done 
And if the investor doesn't like it, continue to advocate and push for it, right? To try and convince them that you're right and they're wrong. That's not the right model of discourse with your, uh, or interaction with your VC. You should think of your VC as a business partner. And what you're doing is you're doing some hypothesis testing together. Now, they're not, they're not together with you in the sense that they're with you all the time. But when you do something, you run a test or you uh, test out a new market or you make a marketing investment, whatever it is that you've done, and there's a question about whether it succeeded or failed, let's say it failed, and the, and the VC asks you what happened, you're sharing data with that individual and you should just openly share it and you shouldn't try to hide what you did. You should try and explain why you did it, why you thought it would work. And if you think that you did the right thing, given the information you had, you should say it. And if you think you made a mistake, you should say that. Think of it more like from a scientific point of view. You're collecting data and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're crunching it together. Now, the one thing you have to keep in mind is they're not on your team. You're, you know, even your most active board members aren't going to be there with you all the time. Mm -hmm. But don't think about it as advocacy. It's not a, you know, it's not a courtroom. (laughs) You shouldn't think of it that way Um, because you're going to, you're going to get defensive around things that you, you and your team should just be learning from. And I don't think that's what VCs want from their portfolio companies. They want people who are dynamic, people who learn from their failures and people who are not afraid to admit that they've had failures. Cool. I think that's a great um, ending note or pausing note. Um, just as a follow-up here, uh, if people wanted to get a hold of you or um, follow up and ha- have you help them with their problem solving, um, how, how would you like them to reach out to you? Uh, they can send me an email. They can add me on LinkedIn. Um, any way they want to reach out, I'm, I, I'm, I'm here to help. All right, cool. All right, this has been the Particle 41 Particle Accelerator. See you later, Ben. All right, bye. Bye.